and thank you everybody for coming. The driving force behind this project, this is an unusual project, and let me give you a little bit of uh, back information. I am an education major, and my concentration is secondary English. So this is an unusual choice for a project, but my driving force was that a few semesters ago, I was in a cross-listed women's study and English course. And during that course, I had found that 35 states, one of which is Indiana, do not require that sex education be medically accurate. That was a stunning statistic for me. So I became interested in what are the standards then for Indiana? And I had found that to teach sex education in Indiana, which is not required, but if a student, if a school chooses to do so, the accredited school must teach that abstinence from sexual activity outside of marriage is the expected standard that abstinence is the only certain way to avoid pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, and other health problems. And the best way to avoid these transmitted diseases and problems is to establish a mutually faithful monogamous relationship in the context of marriage. And there's value to these items for certain, but they are not by any means comprehensive. The state only requires that schools provide education for safety, hygiene, breast and testicular cancer, the human organ donor program, and HIV and AIDS awareness, which again is abstinence based. There are no other expectations for health education in the state of Indiana. In December 2002, the Indiana State Board of Education formally adopted the Indiana Academic Standards for Health Education which was then amended in 2007. It's aligned with the National Health Education Standards and it states that schools are not required to follow a specific curriculum. They also, again, do not need to provide medically accurate information or texts and provide any education beyond abstinence. So to find out who is following these standards, because do keep in mind that while these are the Indiana State standards, individual schools may choose to offer further curriculum. They may choose to offer texts that are more comprehensive, but that is something that the community and the school themselves must agree to do. So my goal was to find out what texts are being used. And I contacted each of the nine districts, schools within each of the nine congressional districts in Indiana I made a total of 61 calls to 42 schools, and it yielded eight answers. I got hung up on a few times. Of those eight, answer, of those eight answers, six textbooks were in, used, in use. Uh, there were two schools that used the Glencoe and two schools that used the uh, Prentice, and one online curriculum. And the, the texts that are used are Glencoe Health, and to clarify, it's not all the same Glencoe Health book. There are two versions that are kind of targeted towards high school, upper high school levels. There are also two versions. There is the Teen Health 2, the Teen Health 3, which are in use. And so that Glencoe Health represents four different textbooks. The Prentice Hall Pearson Health, again, there was an online version in use and there was a text version in use. They were the same book. And then Plato Online was the last one that I had discovered. I tried to get a copy of this so that I could kind of assess what information it included. But in order to get access to this, you have to put in some sort of code that your school gives you. And since I'm not affiliated with any local Indiana school, I could not do that. So for the Glencoe Health, we're actually quite fortunate. These texts are authored by Dr. Hubbard, Dr. Uh, Bronson, and Dr. Cleary. These are all very, very highly qualified educators. Um, Dr. Cleary, I should note, was one of the original um, individuals who worked at McMillan Health Center here in Fort Wayne. The Prentice Hall Pearson Health that is authored by Pruitt, and I am not gonna pronounce this right, <laughs> All Grante and Prutho Sith. These are individuals who are known in their field of authorship. These are all texts that, again, we are very, very fortunate because it did not need to go this way. But these are all individuals who are highly skilled and highly qualified. 
So to discuss the standards and what was and was not included within the book, I had the opportunity to interview both Dr. Hubbard, who wrote those texts, who authored those texts for high school, the upper high school levels. I also spoke with Dr. Cleary, who co-authored the middle school texts and again worked at the McMillan Health Center. And I asked them a little bit about some of the information that was and was not included in these books. And Dr. Hubbard shared with me that there was a challenge when it comes to developing comprehensive text because they must align with standards for many, many states. As a matter of fact, Dr. Cleary had actually used the word benign when I interviewed him, that health text needs to be benign because they are definitely very, very aware of any sort of pushback that they might receive from parents or the community. So finding out what the standards were and what they were not, I decided, what if I define what the ideal standards are? My ideal standards are that health education should be medically accurate, that it should be delivered by teachers who are qualified to teach health education, and again, most Indiana schools do this by choice, and that it should be a requirement of all accredited Indiana schools, and at this time, it is not. The content that I would like to see added to Indiana high schools is that it is mandatory that affirmative consent be taught in every health course throughout high school in every single school in Indiana. That that consent curriculum will include the definition of harassment and assault, the definition of affirmative consent, what it is and is not, and an instruction that consent is, applies to all physical acts of affection from hugging and kissing beyond. Indiana does not include the topic of consent in any of the textbooks that I view, none of them. What they did focus on was refusal skills. And refusal skills are skills that students are encouraged to employ when they are asked to do something that they do not agree with or feel uncomfortable with. It concentrates on their ability to effectively say no. Refusal skills put the onus of not engaging in an action on the person who is being questioned to have the action. It is their responsibility for refusal skills to say no clearly and effectively. Affirmative consent puts that responsibility on the person who is requesting and initiating. It makes the individual, it causes the individual to make sure they are in a place where they have received clear communication that a yes was given. So while refusal skills are one half of the equation, the person being asked, affirmative consent involves the other half of the equation. And to not teach both of these means that one party has a voice that did not get heard. For the purpose of the House bill, and that was the summation of this project, is I wrote a mock House bill. This involved this drafting manual for the Indiana General Assembly, thoughtfully provided by Helmke Library, thank you. And this book was the instruction necessary to complete these 50 lines of text. <laughs> a lot of regulations. In my mock house bill, I state that affirmative consent is given freely. It is retractable. It is active and ongoing. It is provided with prior knowledge of the act being consented. It is not assumed. It is not pressured or coerced. It is not a reluctant response and silence at no point is ever an indicator of consent. This is an important topic because in 2015, 2016, more than 15% of schools reported serious violent incidents, which included rape, sexual assault, and physical attack. In 2010, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey found that one in five women will be the victim of rape within their lifetime. That 43.9% of Indiana women have been subjected to sexual violence other than rape. 
In a 2015 survey conducted by NORC, they were formally uh, called the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, they surveyed adults all across the nation and discovered that there was still persistent confusion among adults what constitutes affirmative consent and sexual assault. As a matter of fact, that survey yielded that one in 10 adult men stated that they believed that contact such as kissing or touching was consent for further action. We know where we are, we know where we wanna go. So the purpose is to legislate change. And to do this, I spoke with uh, Representative Tom Cochran. He is a member of the House of Michigan. He proposed HB 5734, HB 5735. This is a version of a House bill that requires consent for sexual education. And it is very, very similar to what I am looking to do here. This actually happened, um, say, early this month, maybe late last month, that I discovered that this bill was being presented. I interviewed Representative Cochran, and he had shared with me that this is not the first time that he has attempted to pass such a measure in Michigan. This is, I believe he said, the fourth. And this is something that is a constant ongoing struggle. So the proposed House bill that would, med, would amend Indiana health education standards will be, would be similar to what Representative Cochran has proposed, but it would not be identical. It would state that Indiana schools must provide instructor, instructors that are qualified to teach in health education, and by Indiana regulation, near as I could find, that entails being a certified teacher, and taking approximately six hours of coursework that applies only to health instruction. That the text and materials are medically accurate and that affirmative consent and relationship violence are both addressed. Schools would not be permitted to opt out of this education. Now, another thing that is important to note is during the writing of this project, during the, the compilation of this project, I discovered there is a bill that is being proposed now that has passed the House, but not the Senate, that would change the way our sex education is delivered so that parents would need to opt in. In other words, students would not be offered health education whatsoever unless parents actively sought it out and signed for that ha to happen for their child. Mine would give the presumption that it will be offered and that parents could opt out on behalf of their child separately for each unit, one for consent, one for relationship violence, or if the student is 18 or emancipated, they would be able to do that on their own. I add to that that the parent would receive the materials relating to the unit. And this provision is an effort to respect some of the pushback that I've received that it is that parent's right to educate their child on this topic. So that is 100% fine, but how about if we adhere to the uniform standards by providing the materials for that parent to use if they choose to do so. So the effort to write to draft a mock bill seems a little strange that I would put that kind of effort into it. So what do I even hope to accomplish from any of this? My hope is that Indiana students would have the resources to understand the definitions of misconduct assault and violence, that they would be able to understand that they have that bodily autonomy and what affirmative consent is, to be able to hear when it is not given, that they would be able to recognize when they have been victimized by another individual and be able to have access to the resources to get them the help that they need. I would also like there to be a cultural shift that comes from this project. I, just a little bit to understand, I have spoken with two uh, representatives, one in Indiana and, and again, uh, Mr. Cochran in Michigan about this, and it is my intention to carry this through, to uh, push for legislation to happen in Indiana. This is not once I'm done with this, you know, I receive a congratulations, you passed. I sincerely want this to be something that passes. 
And when that does, the cultural shift would, I hope, reduce incidents of misconduct that it would increase incidents of people having that comfort level of bodily autonomy, and that it would cause healthier interpersonal relationships. Another benefit from comprehensive education is that it helps push forward a sense of equality, that each individual has that right to self. They have the right to say what they do and do not want to happen with their own physical being. I would also like there to be a legal shift, that there would be more assaults that are uh, actually reported and dealt with. There is confusion, according to that NORC survey, there is that confusion about what does and does not constitute. Let's clear up that confusion and get that resolved. That way people who are intentionally or unintentionally preying upon others have some sort of recourse that changes that behavior. And perhaps even reduce those incidents of relationship violence. While this project is geared towards high school and the bill specifically mentions high school students, I would also like to see this filter down a little bit more into those grade school. And what that would look like, when I spoke with uh, Bethany Saltman, she was one of the women of Antioch, a group that in early 1990s, they had discussed affirmative consent and had wanted to integrate that as part of Antioch College. And she had stated with me in an interview that she teaches consent to her child like from birth. And I asked her, what does that look like for a child that young? And she had stated to me that consent at a young age is as simple as no, as long as you politely say no. You do not need to kiss grandma. You do not need to hug your uncle. She had stated, for girls in particular, it is a dangerous thing to tell them that their body is for the pleasure of others. And so her children are not required to give or receive affection. And that would be the standard that I would be looking at for grade school and middle school. So if I'm gonna pass this as a law, if that is my goal, how does that happen? I had to learn this process, so now I'm sharing it with you. A bill becomes law because an individual has an idea for a code or a law or an amendment. They take that to a legislative representative. They can be in the House or the Senate. It's drafted by special attorneys at the Legislative Services Agency. And again, this is what they rely upon. This is the same manual that they use for their bill writing. They probably understand it a great deal more than what I did, though. The bill is introduced by that legislator to their respective chamber. That means if they are in the House, that's where it goes. If they are in the Senate, that's where it is, um, that's where it is introduced. And the Senate has uh, President pro, pro Tempore, and the House has a standing committee. It is heard in, by the chair of the committee. Uh, it is to heard, and the chair of the committee may ask for comments. Other people within the chamber could voice their opinions at that time and it will be approved, amended, or rejected. If it's rejected, it's simply sent back to the originating chamber. If it's approved or amended, it goes to a second reading. And in that second reading, the bill, again, receives questions and clarification, and it is amended, rejected, or sent on. It's sent back. Oh, no. If this bill passes that third round. This is actually one of the most um, intensive um, phases for that bill. Legislators at this time could challenge or debate the merits of the bill. And on the chance that this passes, it would be because a roll call vote was taken and a constitutional majority is reached and that's 51 or more in the House, 26 or more in the Senate. And the bill made it. Not actually. If it received that constitutional majority of the vote, if it's in the House, now it must go to the Senate. If it was in the Senate, now it must go to the House. And it repeats the entire process. First reading. And a little bit of um, some clarification. When I say amendment, this means that a bill is subjected to amendment by other parties. 
This means that if this bill originally states consent, one of the legislators could literally write the word not and completely reverse all the action of the bill. It goes through that second reading, again, a third reading, again. And at this point, if it has in fact made it through and the merits of the bill have in fact been um, settled, it goes to a committee where it is then called an enrolled act. At this point, the committee must reach an agreement on the bill language. It must be voted again. And the Office of the Attorney General will review it to make sure that it is constitutional. It will then be sent to the governor. He may sign it into law. He may veto it. The House and Senate must override both, override the veto with a constitutional majority again. And it would be made into law whether or not the governor signed it. When it is passed, it becomes bound in the acts of Indiana and will take effect July 1st of the year unless otherwise stated. This is the process I hope for my bill. And one of the ways that bills get passed is that the idea gets put, forth, put forth for a legislator. If this bill makes sense, that is something that all of you could help do. Talk to legislators, talk to your representatives, talk to your senators, and let them know that Indiana standards are not sufficient. We must raise them. Thank you. Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Thank you so much. This was such an interesting project and interesting research that you've done. It actually, Except the part about the bill. <laughs> well, no, it actually uh, it dovetails very nicely into some work that Dr. Druin and I have been doing. Um, oh. We recently published some work um, that we surveyed uh, 50 states, all 50 states' legislation, sexting legislation, okay. the current status of it. And we also put out a call for uniformity. Um, and so my question is, is with regard to um, the proposed bill that you've created, do you um, think that including the legal penalties or legal implications in your um, education in schools, um, for example, what are the legal implications of statutory rape or what are the okay. legal implications of um, sexting, for example, um, do you think that that would help educate students, at least, you know, to understand the parameters of what is consent, what is it consent, okay. and if someone doesn't consent, you know, what, what the potential ramifications are for them long term? So your, um, your question is essentially the value of letting students know that there are legal consequences if mm -hmm. they do not adhere to these standards. Yes. So you've, you've talked about, you know, increasing yeah. the, the health you know, education aspect, also mm -hmm. educating them about consent. Would you consider also educating them about the legal implications to be an important part of mandatory, you know, sex education? I certainly would. Um, that is something that I would be very interested in. I, there are, when this project began, I actually had a, a pretty uh, hefty list of things that I would have liked to have uh, included. When I spoke with, um, Representative Cochran, he'd, he'd actually had stated that uh, there, you, uh, I'm sorry, no, not Representative Cochran, it was uh, Dr. Leary, that caution needs to be exercised when you're including these types of curriculum because there is a risk that the entire content could be rejected over one or two items. And so I was very conscientious of that, and that's why I scaled it back. But at a later date, absolutely, there is definite value to that. Thank you. So you had mentioned that you called, I can't remember how many schools it was. Uh, I believe it's 62. 62, and you had eight? Or, no, 42 schools. Yes. Um, Eight yeah. responses. So my question is, since for Indiana it's not a standard to teach sex education, it's up to the school itself, mm -hmm. 
Is there any research in the past that's been done as to how many schools are actively doing that, whether in Indiana or another state that doesn't require it? I'm just curious how many are taking that initiative upon themselves. It's an excellent question. It is one that I spent the better part of a week researching and could not find any answer because schools may change from year to year. Um, they may adopt a textbook and not use any of it. They may choose to use all of it and supplemental material. So I didn't find any statistics whatsoever on that. It is, um, it, they rely on self-reporting and with some of the, the reaction that I received, um, that self-reporting, I, I don't imagine it will be forthcoming. If it helps, Fort Wayne Community School was very, very forthcoming about what they offer and, and actually did uh, quite well. So that's something. I had a question about the textbooks. You mentioned that you had looked at some textbooks that mm -hmm. schools use that didn't include this curriculum. Correct. And did you have the opportunity to view any textbooks that did include this? How do they go about teaching this uh, to students? I did not find any textbook in the state of Indiana that included consent. And when I but had- just in general. I don't mean this currently. Oh, I mean, in so general. You're, so you're proposing this bill, so then it's, teachers are gonna need a textbook. What does that textbook look like? Okay, in the state of California, consent is something that is mandatory if they offer sexuality education, and their textbook um, offers supplemental information, I believe. They use many of the same textbooks we do in Indiana, but they also get a kit, the, the teacher gets a kit, and it includes some of those supplemental instructions. So if Indiana were to adopt this, they would not necessarily even need to um, replace their textbook. They would simply need to tap into those supplemental instructions. Or, um, and I, I do outline in my bill, they may, um, they may pull the, that from anywhere so long as it goes through a, a, a review process to make sure that it is accurate. So yes, uh, California is successfully doing this. So um, earlier on you said that you received some pushback. Yes. Um, so what were the reasons for the pushback and did you take those reasons into consideration to finding more research on those reasons? Um, for school or for individuals? Schools. Uh, school pushback. Um, Actually both. Okay. Uh, for school pushback, they, it was more in the, in the form of um, being transferred to another department um, and being told to leave a message that I never received back. Um, one school literally hung up on me. Um, and it was more the, just a reluctance to answer the question whatsoever. From individuals, one of the most common uh, questions that I had heard was consent, won't consent teach students that it is okay to say yes. I don't want my child learning consent. I had one father say, well, I'm not really worried about that because my kid's got a good head on her shoulders. And that is a very, very common pushback. And even the authors of the textbook had stated that that was where consent tends to be problematic for many, is that they view this as us telling students that it's okay to say yes. Consent is more focused on how to help students hear when they did not get a yes. And the way that I would respond to that is exactly that, is it's, it's not about teaching your child to say yes. It's about teaching the person that they date in the future to hear when they didn't. Um, re as for research, um, in England, um, the Netherlands, and in California, all of them have health curriculum that includes consent. And at this time, because that was, uh, that was adopted right around 2015, 2016, there, is not, um, there isn't statistics that specifically apply to consent, but I can tell you that in the Netherlands where they've had comprehensive sexuality education for several years, they have a lower rate of assault, um, pregnancy, um, HIV, AIDS, and other sexually transmitted infections. So, it is, there's certainly some success there on some level. Did any of the parents maybe have some pushback because they don't think it's an appropriate discussion to have in school because of yes. backgrounds, because of culture, religion, whatever it may be? Yes, they did. And I had, I had shared with them that the bill that I have proposed 
while it does not allow students to opt out, it does allow parents to opt out. There is some measure of comfort in that. There's a few parents here and there that do not want this taught to their child or any other child. And that's a struggle that I'm, I'm not sure how to address quite yet other than to share with them the ways that this is, um, this is a relevant topic. Uh, Representative Cochran, the way he got interested in this is that in the state of Michigan, women are four times more likely to be sexually assaulted on a college campus than anywhere else. And think of how many years you spend in college and how many years you spend anywhere else. And last question, oh sorry. So why did you pick Michigan and why didn't you speak to any representative in Indiana? I spoke, I attempted to speak with two representatives in Indiana. One never responded, the other had the, her assistant respond. And it was to provide me with basic information on the bill that they were proposing and little more. Um, I chose Michigan because my mentor came across, within the past several weeks, came across this article about Representative Cochran and the fact that it was a touching state um, where you know we physically are against Michigan. That really interested me because you hear a lot about Midwest, uh, just the Midwest values, thinking that maybe this would be something that we would not approve of. And to find that this was something being attempted in Michigan was, was pretty exciting for me. So I was curious as you think about this project going forward, mm -hmm. if, um, if you have any ideas of any kinds of groups or organizations, agencies within the state of Indiana that might be you know, interested in kind of what you're working on that you might reach out to. Um, just as you think about this project going forward? The, I haven't really given too much thought into the organizations, but it is something that going forward I absolutely want to research. I kind of envisioned um, places like McMillan Health Center, and that's here in Fort Wayne, but there are others like that throughout the state. I, I more envisioned going to them and asking them, how, how is this something that could be integrated into your curriculum? Mm -hmm. But as for um, like people to help me uh, you know, pu push this through as a bill, I, I haven't reached out to those resources yet, but I will. So did you do, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it, but did you do uh, some research on the before and after uh, the bill was passed in Michigan? The bill has not yet passed. Oh, has not passed no, yet. No, this is his okay. fourth attempt to pass the bill. And um, where it passed in California, again, because that was so recent, I don't have that data yet. I, I looked for it, and that has not been generated yet. It will probably within this calendar year, though. It would be interesting in the future to see your role in following up with that research and see what your project is um, past this point. I it would, would be beneficial. I would be so honored if this actually was something that was heard and and that would be lovely. Just the process itself. The you process know, to start itself. the process and then go forward, it would be very interesting to see how that goes, whether okay. it passes or not. But okay, right. yeah, it's a good idea. Kind of keep along. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Catherine. Thank you very much.